Tonight, we have an absolutely incredible opportunity. We are surrounded by entomology contraptions. Jack and Chris have brought out some light traps. So we are set up here in Eastern Pennsylvania as we so often do, and we are looking for any manner of invertebrates that will be attracted to these lights and come in so we can take a closer look. Hello. As you can see, it's already starting. <laughs> yep. So Whoa. Jack, yes. as our visitor here in PA, what are your targets for tonight? Well, I'm a big fan of moths and beetles. So all the moths and beetles we can get is, is what I want us to get. Absolutely. <laughs> and Chris, you've done light traps here many times in the past. What do you oh, think yeah. we'll find out yeah. here tonight? We're definitely going to find a lot of Lipidopter, like a lot of moths, and uh, probably a bunch of beetles, which I'm really hoping for. It seems like a really promising night. The moon isn't quite as bright as it was a few nights ago, and that's going to work in our favor with these light traps. All right, yep. so I think all there is to do now is sit and wait, see who comes to the light trap. All right. Setting up a light trap is probably the most efficient way to catch up with a ton of amazing insects, and it hasn't even taken a full minute for a staggering variety of inverts to start moving in. The reason that bright lights attract insects is that many insect species will actually navigate by moonlight or starlight, and the brightness of an artificial light causes many passing insects to confuse it for a natural light source and navigate towards it. This is great for us, as it allows us to observe a whole host of incredible invertebrates without having to harm them at all, just borrow a bit of their time. And look at that, just in the time we've been talking, Chris has spotted the first beetle of the night. I say this all the time, but this is one of my favorite beetle species for, for the area, and people often mistake these for June bugs, which of course is not a bug, it's a beetle, and this is not a June bug. This is a grapevine beetle, and the difference is this ha they have this beautiful varnish type appearance to the exoskeleton, and they have these characteristic spots most of the time along the, the margin of the elytra and two of them on their thorax. And they've also got these wonderful digging legs, even though they spend most of their time up in grapevines, but they're not a threat to the agricultural Shall industry. Shall we take a look? Absolutely. Sure, buddy. This is one insect I have yet to actually interact with this evening. Who are you? Right. They have incredibly strong tarsal claws, like a lot of the beetles we'll be finding tonight. Those hooks, can you see those hooks in there? Yeah. That helps them that. climb extraordinarily well, and that's true of a lot of the different beetles that we've been seeing tonight. And as Chris was talking about, they are called grapevine beetles, but they don't inhabit the grapes that we use commercially for agriculture, so they're not going to impact the production of wine or anything like that. They inhabit more of our native grapevines and other things out in the environment. But what a cool little beetle. Despite how common they are, Evan and I don't see these a lot. So this is actually really cool. Now, funny story about grapevine beetles. Grapevine beetles have always thrown me for a loop because these little scarab larvae um, look a lot like lucanid larvae, which are stag beetles. And me, being the stag beetle fanatic that I am, every time I go out and look for these larvae, I always get the slip, because I'm like, did I just find some stag beetle larvae? No. And their larvae grow as they eat rotting logs and wood and things like that. Look at that guy. That is a sword-bearing conehead katydid, one bizarre little insect that we've really been hoping to show you tonight. A lot of times people will mistake the, uh, the sounds that they make for crickets, yeah. but actually a lot of the insects you'll hear calling at this time of year are actually katydids, like this guy. Oh yeah. And you can see where they get the name conehead, that refers to a group of katydids, not just a species, but he has that adorable little unicorn horn there. One of the many cool insects we're hoping to show you tonight. Take a look at that yeah. guy. And he was just uh, making his call, which could have been used as an alarm call or distress agitation call, but I don't think so. They don't usually do that when they're handling them. There we go. So that was pretty cool. He's striating his abdomen a bit there. That's how they call. They don't call from their mouths, from their heads, anything like that. They rub their wings. Will you do it? Their legs and their wings. It's Super scary. loud earlier, sitting yeah. up on top yeah. of the world. Yeah. Seriously. 
I love Katie did. Of all the insects to join us at our light trap tonight, the most abundant by far seem to be the moths. There are over 500 species of moths found in Pennsylvania, and we are actually surrounded by some of the coolest among them. Just take this beautiful azalea sphinx moth, for example. Isn't she gorgeous? This is a very large and pretty common member of the sphingid or sphinx moth family, and one that we don't often see up close, as sphinx moths are incredibly agile flyers and can be hard to observe in mid-flight. We also have a beautiful harnessed tiger moth around us, and this species has a very unique ability. These guys have sonar distracting and absorbing scales. So the bats either can't see them at all with their sonar, or it tells them that it's somewhere else. Same with That's the tails crazy. on the Luna moth. So it deflects the sonar of bats. Yep. Or wow, absorbs amazing. it. With so many moths around, we could focus on them all night, but there is so much more to show you. So let's get back to the main trap and see what species have made their way in. So there is a fiery searcher. And he's look at the Look at the, the color on his legs, man. Oh, That's yeah, like beautiful. jewelry, dude. You're yeah, Chris has built-in jewelry right there. Yeah, man. Don't now, have to go down your shoes. Now, Chris, yeah. talk about what color this animal actually is in the absence of light. Probably brown, grayish brown. And that is because this species has what's called structural coloration. So there aren't really that many, if any at all, pigments in their body. All of the coloration you're seeing on this beetle are a result of light refraction from the structure of their bodies. So that green coloration there on the wing casing, what we call the elytra on beetles, is all a result of the structure of the exoskeleton. And that's true of the legs. When we flip them over, you'll see a gorgeous iridescent sheen on them. Thank you. All of which is a result right. of their structure. Let me try and get that underside for you because I really think it's worth yeah. talking about. Now that I have him, you can see that beautiful iridescent color that Harrison was talking about. And you guys uh, can't smell it, but we certainly can. This guy is musking like crazy. Is uh, that showing up on camera or do you want me to change? Sometimes if he moved the, cause he's probably gonna look black because the camera's trying to compensate for the skin. Yeah. Right. Now, worth noting that I am applying the gentlest amount of pressure to this guy. It's not hurting him in any way. He's a little confused as to why he's upside down, but we are certainly not harming this animal at all. And is that why they call them fiery searchers? I actually yep. don't know. Yeah, yeah, because like especially like in the daylight, um, along their like the thorax area and the margin of the elytra, the you get like this red mm -hmm. highlight that just stands that out. That is absolutely gorgeous. So we've got a mantid fly here, and uh, sorry, it's kind of silhouetted, but this is a white sheet, so that's how it goes. But if you look at the shadow, you can see those formidable forearms right now and it can begin to chow down. Now what's really cool about mantid flies is the fact that they're a perfect expression of convergent evolution. Those look just like praying mantis arms, although they fold in a different direction than the mantises do. And they both are completely unrelated species. However, they serve the same purpose. Sometimes necessity is the best mother of invention and efficiency can sometimes be reached as the same destination via different routes. And if I may, we have a perfect example of that with a true mantis right here in hand. So you can see how similar these two animals are in their body structure. They do, you can actually see her, look at her, or him reaching out with those perfect arms there. Look at that, how amazing is that? Absolutely, and how really? successful these animals Absolutely. were to, to have persevered through so many time periods yep. that As we like everything to say, was out to get These them. guys are true evolutionary masterpieces. That's why they've been able to persist for so long. And precisely why you see insects in completely different orders yep. right. with the same hunting structures. All right, I would call this a resounding success. We had some incredible finds. With the light trap here, I think we all had an amazing time tonight. Oh, yeah. What do you think? Favorites yeah, for you guys? You know. 
Oh, probably, um, I love seeing Praying Mantis, of course. And the Mantis fly, I think, was a yeah, yeah. pretty heavy yeah. hitter for all of us. That, that was really that cool. That was, for me, to see a Mantis fly yep. for the first time for the two of us, absolutely fantastic. Yeah. How yeah. about you, Chris? You know, I, I get excited anytime I see a Mantis fly. Those things just rock. Mm -hmm. To be able to compare it with the Mantis was cool. Oh, mm -hmm. fast. Fiery stuff. Searcher oh, got yeah, my heart yeah, going even yep. more. Mm -hmm. And actually seeing the water beetle here was, was a pleasant surprise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But honestly, my favorite experience of the night was hanging out with everybody. Yeah. I mean, that's just, it's remember the, that for the rest of my life. It's the greatest honor we could ever ask for, so please make sure to check out Jack's World of Wildlife and Nature Here and Now with Chris Ignato. Without these two guys, we would have no idea what we're doing, <laughs> literally fumbling in the dark, but they made this experience absolutely amazing, and shout out to Gage behind the camera oh, yeah. as well. <laughs> yep. So please give their channel some love. <laughs> And if you want to see more from us, we will link a video right here where we check out some amazing invertebrates down in Costa Rica, some of the really cool stuff we found down in the tropics. And with that, we hope you enjoyed, and we'll see you in the next one. They're not dangerous, but that's my goal. <laughs> to get kids bit see, like by now, animals that aren't dangerous. <laughs> and that's how you remember it. <laughs> That's right, kids. You can pick up harmless animals that you learn about on my channel. <laughs> yeah, okay, anyway. Look, look at this little sphinx moth.